Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. This week, we're bringing you another conversation from our recent Poverty Cure Summit. The Poverty Cure Summit provided an opportunity for participants to listen to scholars, human service providers, and practitioners address the most critical issues we face today, which can either exacerbate or alleviate poverty. These speakers discuss the legal, economic, social, and technological issues pertaining to both domestic and global poverty. Rooted in foundational principles of anthropology, politics, natural law, and economics, participants had the opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the root causes of poverty and identify practical means to reduce it and promote human flourishing. In this conversation, moderator Al Cresta talks with Baroness Philippa Stroud, CEO of the Legatum Institute, and Anne Rathbone Bradley, the George and Sally Mayer Fellow for Economic Education and the Academic Director at the Fund for American Studies, about poverty and the COVID-19 pandemic. For decades, the number of individuals living in extreme poverty across the globe has fallen. Yet recently, the World Bank reported that COVID-19 could add approximately 100 million people to the ranks of those living in extreme poverty by the end of 2020. The panelists examine how the pandemic has impacted poverty reduction efforts and how the marketplace has responded to the pandemic. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Act in Line on our website at acton.org slash act in line. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Well, it's very good to be with you today uh, here at the Poverty Cure Summit of uh, Acton Institute. And uh, we are focusing uh, in the next 45 minutes specifically on poverty and COVID-19. The World Bank has suggested that uh, over the next year, we're going to see for the first time in 20 years a uh, disruption, uh, largely due to COVID-19 and the pandemic, Uh, we're going to see, in fact, uh, an increase in global extreme poverty for the first time in 20 years. And that's one of the topics we're going to want to be touching on today. My guests uh, with us is, first of all, Baroness Philippa Stroud, CEO of the Legatum Institute. Uh, Previously, she was chief executive of the Center for Social Justice, a think tank that she co-founded in 2004. Her life and career to date have been strongly influenced by her passion to tackle poverty and social uh, breakdown. I'm Baroness, it's good to have you with us. Very good to be with you too. And we're also going to be joined by Dr. Ann Rathbone Bradley. She's the George and Sally Mayer Fellow for Economic Education and Academic Director at the Fund for American Studies, as well as an Acton Affiliate Scholar. She's co-editor and author of Counting the Cost, Christian Perspectives on Capitalism, Also, for the least of these, a biblical answer to poverty, as well as be fruitful and multiply, why economics is necessary for making God-pleasing decisions. And uh, Dr. Bradley, it's good to be with you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Let's let's go, first of all, to that claim of the World Bank that we're going to see for the first time in uh, 20 years uh, an increase in extreme global poverty. Uh, they attribute that to three, the big three C's, uh, conflict, uh, COVID, and uh, also climate. Uh, let me ask you, first of all, do you think that that's likely? Are we likely to see an increase in global poverty for the first time in 20 years as a result of the changed circumstances? I'll begin with you, Anne. I think that there's a lot we have to see uh, and there's a lot yet to occur. And I think that our responses to this are going to matter greatly. And so, yes, I think it's possible that we will see, particularly in the poorest parts of the world, uh, when you deal with a crisis like this, you lack the infrastructure and you lack the capital, you lacked uh, the robust social safety net and just legitimate governments that can help, um, you know, kind of restore and, uh, 
help people get out of the crisis. So I think what we need to be watching is are the poorest countries in the world. On the other hand, I would also say that, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into more of this later, but uh, you know, our policy responses in the wealthy countries will have kind of uh, ripple effects in the poorest countries. So lockdowns, closing down businesses, these types of things, if we depress incomes uh, for a sustained period of time, then uh, charitable money will flow at lower rates or um, maybe not at all, depending on the situation, to the people who need it the most. So I think the policy responses in both types of countries are going to matter greatly. We'll come back to that question about the wealthier nations and the influence they can have on the near future. Uh, Baroness, let me ask you the same question I asked Anne, and that is, do you think that we are likely to see an increase in extreme global poverty, largely as a result of the uh, uh, pandemic this year? Thank you. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is um, we published our Global Prosperity Index uh, on Tuesday of this week, actually, um, and within that um, is all the data which charts where we were at just before COVID hit. And what that tells us is that global prosperity was actually at its highest level ever. And that is largely down to the fact that um, economies have been opening up around the world. And we saw that um, raising the living standards of people, for instance, in China and in India, and that's where large numbers of people have been lifted out of poverty. Uh, but what we're also seeing just before we went into the COVID pandemic was that issues like governance and personal freedom was just beginning to decline. And uh, that is a worrying trend that has been exacerbated, I think, as we've gone into COVID, as we've seen nations lock down their economies and um, restrict the freedoms of their people, which will lead to a decline in global prosperity, let alone the economic impacts that that um, can cause. So I suspect that we will be looking at a decline in global prosperity, certainly next year. However, we, that's within our gift. We can do something about it. As we come out of this, we can open our economies back up again, we can restore freedoms to, to people. So I, I, I think some of this is in our, in our decision making. Uh, stay with that for a moment. Do you see where you see po people rising out of poverty in China and in India? Uh, are we seeing that uh, those two countries, which have been coming out of poverty, uh, do we see that they will also be suffering as a result of this pandemic? I mean, China already has fairly limited freedoms by Western standards. Uh, will they be, will China and India both be uh, influenced the same way that the Western nations are being influenced by this pandemic? No, uh, most, most definitely. And um, when you see that uh, China features, I think it's something like 90th for governance and 159th out of 167 countries for personal freedoms, and then they lock down their freedoms <laughs> even more. Yeah after that, then, then yes, you are going to be res restricting um, uh, the growth and development of, of prosperity, and that, that will have an impact. And actually, we were already seeing um, a, 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 an emerging trend in just the beginnings of stagnation in the, in the APAC region. So um, something to definitely be, be watchful for in our quest for creating the pathways from poverty to prosperity. And let me come back to what you suggested earlier, and that is that the wealthy nations, uh, their behavior in responding to uh, the COVID pandemic uh, will have an influence on the least, uh, the less prosperous nations. Exactly how does that play? What, what do we do or don't do in the wealthier nations that will influence the less prosperous nations? So there's many aspects of governance and policy that we can think about that are that are going to have a huge global impact. I think just one that we both talked about already is just the decision to engage in a national lockdown. Uh, that does not stay isolated within one country. We live in a global interdependent, interdependent economy, and that is a good thing. That makes us all wealthier. That is what has contributed to these 
uh, poverty numbers over the last 50 years, which, you know, on net have been extremely encouraging and really remarkable, unpredictable, one would say. And so I think shutting down an economy through national mandate, what it does is it makes it very hard for people to do what they were doing before. And the problem with that is, of course, that they still need their incomes. And so we can talk about stimulus packages and all these types of things, which, of course, wealthy economies have more theoretically to um, to play with there. But, you know, um, for example, in the United States, sending someone, a you know, a thousand or a thirteen hundred dollar stimulus check um, is really not going to cut it. And then, of course, we have to address the question of can we even afford to do that and for how long? So. Uh, that's one aspect of it. It's just going to depress the wealthy economies, which is going to, in turn, mean less goods and services available to trade abroad yeah. and less goods uh, and services to be able to be donated abroad. And so both of those factors of, of what kind of uh, underdeveloped countries depend on uh, are going to suffer under these types of policies that are just ubiquitous Um and it really makes it raises the opportunity cost for ordinary people to do what they, you know, to live their lives and, and do their jobs. And so I think that has income effects that we can probably talk about today, too, that are significant. Mm -hmm. um, Baroness, let me jump uh, to a comparison here. I'd like to say, how do you see the pandemic being treated differently in the U.S. Uh, versus the U.K.? I mean, I think um, I've, I've thought about this question quite a lot, actually. Um, obviously, um, uh, watching your elections and, you know, thinking about what we're going through here as well. And, it, and in many ways, um, there are as many similarities as there are as there are differences. So, um, you know, you've just been through a tumultuous um, election. Um, we are trying to go through Brexit right. at this moment in time. And um, I think the danger is in that that you um, that there's opportunity for the politicising of something that is actually a crisis that people are very genuinely experiencing at a deeply personal level, and um, and there's an opportunity for point scoring, and I think that makes people feel quite insecure. Um, they want the one thing that you want when you're going through through a crisis is is clarity of leadership um, and clear decision decision making. Um, one of the other um, uh, things that I think is quite similar is is we have uh, you have fifty states. So I mean, goodness, you you, you know have all the opportunity for for uh, different approaches and strategies here. But you know we have four nations as well, and and we're we're seeing some of that battle out um, in our in our four na four nations. But if I have to kind of highlight a difference, I think we have probably used our welfare state more to shield people from um, the, the experience or, or the very severe experience of this. The government has instituted a pro, an expansive furlough scheme that pays people 80 percent of their wages up to 2,500 a, a month. And oh. then the welfare state has stepped in um, We've operated an everybody in strategy for anyone on the streets. They've been brought in and, and housed. So I think there's been extensive government action. Um, now, um, you may say in the States there's been um, government action too, but I think it, in the UK it really has been quite, quite remarkable. How we're going to pay for it? I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, that um, I think it's costing us 200 billion. Uh, which may not sound too much by U.S. standards, but is huge by U.K. standards. Yeah. And this question of uh, the role of government in solving these problems, this is always a problem, I think, for uh, people of goodwill. Obviously, we don't like to see uh, any greater suffering than is necessary. We want to know who are the agents capable of solving uh, these problems. And... Uh, Historically, in the United States, from the Second World War, just even before the Second World War, from the Great Depression on, there was the common expectation that government would, uh, in fact, step in and solve all these problems. Big emphasis on building a, a very firm social safety net. In the 1990s, a uh, large debate over welfare and welfare reform. Let me ask, as you look at this crisis, this pandemic, 
this is something that doesn't come around every year, every four years. It's a rare occasion. What role uh, does highly centralized, in this case, federal government, what role do they play in trying to um, smooth out uh, some of the uh, big economic bumps in the road that we're all facing? And this is an important question, and I think it gets to people's perceptions about what the what the market can do versus what the government can do. And of course, they have different roles, but they both are able to allocate scarce resources. And I think, you know, in a in a pandemic, it's 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 not the time to lose our principles of what we know to be true about how markets operate and how governments operate. Each of those sets of institutions has constraints and capabilities. So what I think here, and I've seen some of this, uh, and I'd like to see more of it in the United States, is just, you know, kind of allowing businesses to, to innovate, to improvise, um, to roll back regulations that slow down technological and innovative advancements. And this is particularly true as we think about vaccines. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about vaccines in the last week, which are, yeah. is very encouraging. But if you recall, one of those vaccines had to be held at something like, you know, minus 94 degrees. And so- Right, that's the Pfizer, com- the Pfizer vaccine. Is, that's right. Yeah. And so we have vials that are being, uh, glass vials that are being created to kind of be able to robustly withstand those temperatures. So that is exactly what we need is quick, rapid entrepreneurship. And that most profoundly comes from the state. And so I think where we need the state to step in it can be much more productive at a local level than at a federal level. And so, you know, you kind of made this point earlier. There's different areas of our country, which is very big and lots of states, and they've been hit differently. And I think you need to allow those communities to have community responses and maybe for the federal government to help. Uh, but I think that often the problem is when the, when the government kind of says, you know, we're going to have a lockdown or we're going to have a mask mandate, some of those things may sound good on paper, But I think these longer run unintended consequences, particularly of lockdowns, I'm not sure how helpful they are. I think, um, you know, we really need to distinguish between these sectors of society and which is more empowered um, on the ground level to help people. I was talking to a fellow last week, owner of a wonderful restaurant in Ann Arbor, and uh, he told me how difficult it was for him to get help. Uh, last uh, spring and and in right through the summer because employees that had been laid off uh, for a while uh, when there was the first lockdown were receiving sufficient income that they didn't really think they had to go back to work and they were willing to stay away uh, from the job. That's certainly an unintended, a negative unintended consequence here. Uh, And so this particular uh, business owner uh, who I've known for years, uh, is a very diligent man. Uh, he, he's forced, uh, again, to pay more uh, for uh, work than he had previously. Um, are there other unintended negative consequences that you've seen, Anne, uh, from government uh, taking up areas of responsibility that maybe could be handled at lower levels of uh, responsibility uh, by the principle of subsidiarity? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think there's lots of, um, you know, kind of smaller business type of examples of this where you, you know, if the government again comes in and says, well, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, you're not a necessary business. You're not an, you know, an emergency business. And so therefore you, you need to close or you need to only be to go or carry out or, you know, if it's restaurants, something like this, I think what it does is it, you know, this is again where the community feels the impact. It's not just the entrepreneur who owns that small business who can't operate it, but it's the customers who frequent that small business who can't get the things that they need, the things that they want. So this kind of causes these economic uh, ripple effects. And so I think if we just get out of the way of that and allow, you, you know, I think here's the problem. Uh, there's two problems that are pretty significant. One is that this is an externalities type of problem, right? So other people's behavior in a pandemic affect you, and it's very difficult to monitor that. So that's one issue. And I I think the other issue is that uh, we don't know what's next. We don't know what's in the future. And so I think we need a nimble environment where we can respond in real time. And I think if we allow businesses to do this, then we're able to move forward and find new ways to do things. We're also going to have to engage in social social distancing for a very long time. 
Uh, and so that is going to impact the way businesses operate. But I think if we allow them to innovate, we will find, and I think we are finding that they can do, and they're very willing to do that. Yeah. And so I think the presumption that Mar the government just knows what to tell people to do uh, is incorrect. And I think it's very damaging in the long run with these types of, of examples. Before we get back to this episode of Acton Line, I want to take a moment to tell you about our newest podcast, Acton Institute Events. The Acton Institute's international events include public lectures, academic seminars, joint participation in panels, the annual Acton University Conference, the Institute's annual dinner, and more, all focused on illustrating our vision of a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty, and sustained by religious principles. Previous event speakers have included Acton's own Reverend Robert Sirico, Samuel Gregg, and Michael Matheson Miller. Other speakers have included P.J. O'Rourke, Yuval Levin, Anthony Bradley, Arthur Brooks, Jonah Goldberg, Stephanie Slade, Bradley Berzer, Anne Rathbone Bradley, and many others. To subscribe to the Acton Institute Events podcast, look for a link in the show notes for this episode of Acton Line. Or just search Acton Institute Events on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Now, back to the show. Uh, Philip, let me ask you about, uh, again, Great Britain. Uh, you have a, a tradition, a stronger tradition of the welfare state uh, than here in the United States. Uh, there seems to be less resistance to the idea of... Uh, do you see uh, negative unintended consequences uh, in England, for instance, from uh, the way the state is responding to this present crisis? So, um, yeah, yes, I, I, I do very much. So I think that uh, one, of, one of my concerns is that the state is becoming um, very strong in telling what people what they can't do. Actually, it would be much better if the state could say, this is the way to keep yourself safe. Now, you be ingenious and creative mm -hmm. about how you structure your daily life, keeping yourself and other people safe. And that way, I'm taking responsibility for myself, but I'm also taking responsibility for my actions towards other people to, keep, to make sure that they, they stay safe as well. And... Um, you're always going to have, you know, outliers, whether you legislate or whether you ask for people's cooperation. You're always going to have people who won't cooperate with you. But, you know, the British people largely want to do the right thing and they want mm -hmm. to keep themselves safe and they want to keep their families safe. So if you give them the tools with which they can do that and allow them to keep their businesses flourishing and going, many of them will pivot. We saw whiskey companies, whiskey distilleries, becoming hand sanitizer um, <laughs> creators yeah. during this time. We saw clothes manufacturers pivoting to PPE. You know, we've seen some really ingenious and wonderful business responses. And actually that enables people to feel like we're coming together as a nation and we're going through this together. If you say, the government's the only vehicle for doing anything constructive during this time. You lock down all the ingenuity of your people who are your frontline army in, in you know, in, in great respect. So um, so that would be my my view. Let's let's actually harness um, the energy and creativity of our people and not not shut it down. Uh, this raises for me the question of what is you know, called the common good. In Catholic social teaching, that's a, a big concept. I know it has other, you know, other terms in other settings. But um, uh, let me stay with you on this uh, to begin with, uh, Philippa. Is the, is the concept of the common good, is that something that is still, does it have currency in popular discussion? So if I say, this, we need to do this for the common good, does that have any meaningful um, consequences for people in the uh, UK? Yes, it does. I think one of the things that's, that's a problem in the UK is that the conversation that takes place on in the Twitter sphere um, and the conversation that takes place on our news outlets and amongst the kind of metropolitan elites is not the same as the conversation that goes on in our communities across the country. Interesting. 
the concept of the common good and people doing the right thing by their families and by their communities is alive and kicking in the UK. Um, but it doesn't often get given a voice. It doesn't often get, get expressed on the pages of our newspapers or on the screens of our televisions. Uh, but up and down the country, there have been people making extraordinary decisions. Um, even our nurses and doctors, you know, have been on the front line sacrificially. Many people have been out there sacrificially during this time, making the nation happen. Um, and that th there was a moment during the pandemic, right at the beginning, when everybody felt like we were all in this together, where it felt like the country was coming together. But once we came out of lockdown and once we started um, implementing different strategies in different areas and there wasn't like a good evidence base for some of the choices that were being made, all of that, all of that fell away. And um, uh, but in communities, it's still very much there and alive and, and present. Mm -hmm. Where people actually see one another uh, face to face and interact uh, in the flesh, so to speak. Uh, and l let me go to you, too, on this. In the United States, of course, we've got this great tradition of individualism, the strong, rugged individual, self-sufficient, taking care of oneself. Um, is, the, is the language of the common good still uh, a currency that people use in conversation with any meaning uh, in the United States these days? I would like to echo Philippa's comments. I mean, I think that there's the, the same phenomenon are going on here. I think if we just turn off Twitter, uh, don't listen to what, you know, Hollywood elites and <laughs> politicians say, then what you really hear is people who want to do the right thing, people who want to not just care for their community, uh, for their family and be safe. They want to do that, but they also want to help. They want to, you know, how do we help the elderly who are living alone? How do we really think about the mental health um, toll that, you know, not only that category, but students who are learning in isolation in home while maybe both of their parents are, you know, on other computers working. So I do think there's movements and initiatives. And I think if you were able to pop in to a family dinner conversation, you wouldn't hear, oh my gosh, everybody is evil and they're, they're, <laughs> nobody takes it seriously but me. I think you would hear the opposite. And I think you see churches really rallying to try to help, especially as we approach the holidays. I'm very encouraged by that. What I worry about a little bit is the, um, the media and the way that they kind of um, characterize how Americans are engaging with one another. And if you, again, if we maybe just, get off our Twitter feeds for a little bit, we'll forget about that. But I think their narrative is quite different. It's become highly politicized. And if you're on, you know, if you're on the right, then you think it's a hoax. And if you're on the left, then, you know, you take it seriously. And, and that is absurd. But I think that's kind of the narrative. And I think that creates an environment where people start to potentially distrust one another. That's the worst thing we can do right now. Yep. We really do need to come together. And I think we can. I think that's part of the American foundation and the American spirit but we have to keep that alive and well by doing it. Yeah. Uh, let me stick with you a little longer on this. The United States uh, has a strong, in its history, has a strong emphasis on biblical religion. Uh, evangelical Protestantism was dominant in the 19th century. And uh, certainly since the Second World War, uh, evangelical Protestants have come together and form a major, a major political force in America these days. Uh, but biblical language is not as common. Do you despair of that? Uh, is there any way of recapturing a kind of biblical literacy which gives us a, 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 voca you know, a quarry of uh, language that we can use to come at some of these problems? I, I do agree with you that I think in some, in some ways, um, you know, uh, either Christians are voluntarily retreating from the public square or the, and they're both also feeling pushed out of the public square. And I think that, again, certain um, categories of the elites who control information or who want to control information would tell you that, you know, um, there's no place for biblical principles in the public square. And so, uh, you know, I think that that is what people feel. But again, I'm encouraged by um, when you go into communities, when you go into churches, when you see what people are doing, um, I think they're living out the faith, their faith 
you know, as the best that they can. What we do need to be very protective of is this notion of religious freedom in our country. And I think our country was founded on this notion that people uh, of all types of faiths, across all faiths, this is not just for evangelical Christians or Catholics, this is for anyone of faith, that you have the freedom to live that out in public and in private. And if that goes away, then I I actually think some of the things that are helping us in this pandemic, which is charity, churches, community organizations, that will be on the retreat as well. So I do think we need to be vigilant about this protection of this core idea um, that is, has been so such a part of our heritage. Uh, Philippa, in, in uh, England, you've got uh, a state church. Uh, does that make it any easier to um, discuss matters of public affairs within a, a biblical or a theological framework, uh, does that help or does it hinder? I think that's a very, very uh, good question. I think um, in many ways, um, having having a state church is a good thing. Um, but it also, I think, um, almost, almost feels like um, part of the backdrop to the country, but actually for these principles to be alive and relevant, they need to be woven through the fabric of our, of our conversations. And um, I think that, you know, um, the, the US was founded because of, um, well, originally because of the founding um, of, of those who left our country to come to your country because of a lack of religious tolerance in 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 the UK and uh, we have our own battles here over the protection and the maintenance of freedom of speech and um, it's something that I'm really passionate about um, is protecting um, the right to um, express freely these Christian principles and they're they're incredibly important and we lose them at our peril but not just, you know, Christian principles, but actually somebody even being able to disagree with with Christianity as well. Actually being able to have um, dialogues in the public square where iron can sharpen iron and where uh, we can have the free exchange of ideas is just so important. We have uh, quite a few questions that have come in, and uh, I'd like to begin sharing those with you. Uh, Let's see, we've got, uh, it looks like uh, Socorro from uh, Lima asks, how does it make a difference if government aid is directed at smaller versus larger businesses? Uh, Philippa, I'll start with you. You want to take a shot at that? Yeah, Um, I think that um, if government aid is directed to smaller businesses, then it probably, um, uh, in the UK, it's directed to both. So um, we haven't, I haven't really seen that. But uh, if it were to be directed to smaller businesses, then that, that might help um, keep people on, on the payroll. Bus- uh, larger businesses often have um, greater reserves and resources that they can delve into at a time of, a time of crisis. Um, but uh, there's also an element of, um, you know, how quickly the marketplace can adapt and flex. And if you overprotect businesses um, at a time like this, then you, you stop that process from, from happening. One of the things that, um, you know, we're watchful of is that a number of the jobs that are going at this time would actually, sadly, go at a time of the introduction of AI and increased technology, And um, actually, this can also be a time where some of those people are allowed to transition into other jobs and to upskill and to find new new jobs that are more relevant for them. So so there are some some strengths and weaknesses to that one. And any comment on the relative strengths and weaknesses of government assistance to smaller versus larger business? I would say that, you know, you want to be very careful about the precedent you set when you make, when, you know, policymakers make these types of decisions is, you know, I would ask questions, what are the, what are the time limits on it? Because once you create a stakeholder, whoever you choose, uh, if you choose one at the expense of the other, then we're creating a winners and losers type of environment. And we've created stakeholders who will now do a lot to hold on to the subsidies. Absolutely. I would say, I would rather say a reduction in the tax code across the board, which is going to make it easier for businesses to operate a rolling back of regulations that makes it difficult for them to comply or to kind of keep going. So to me, those are things that you could do across the board 
that would not create this kind of rent-seeking future environment. Yeah, I we um, in the United States we had these PPE loans uh, in the process earlier, and uh, we were actually quite fortunate to be able to get one because we had our ministry at Ave Maria had not been able to conduct our normal semi-annual fundraising. Um, but it is funny. Uh, I confess that it's it's just human nature when you're able to get. Uh, a loan like that to say to yourself, I wonder if we can do that again. You know, <laughs> can we get, I, I'll take more help, you know. Uh, and I, I just think that it's very true uh, that you have to be careful that you don't create some sense of dependency or expectation uh, on the part of any uh, business. Let me, Mike Harper is asking uh, you to comment on the budget deficits. This is appropriate. Uh, the budget deficits caused by pandemic spending and begin with you on that. Sure. So, you know, this is, again, one of the things we have to look at into the future. And so, uh, the, you know, I don't I also don't want to be heard as saying this is not a problem. Right. That I mean, we're living in unprecedented times. And so we, we have to think about what what is the proper role of government here to intervene um, in the short term. But again, I want to think about long run and future spending. And the United States is already not in a very good position. Yeah. Um, here. And so how much can we layer on to that? And policymakers have a natural incentive to kind of worry about that later, right? Uh, uh, the bills will come due later when they're long gone. Um, we're burdening future generations of people who have not even been born yet um, with these types of uh, current uh, uh, spending decisions. And so, you know, we've had a couple stimulus packages already. Um, that's going to impact our financial issues. And I think, you know, Given the way our presidential election has gone, we will probably have more um, as we head into the winter and the cases are going up and the hospitals are getting full again. So, um, you know, I, I think that we need to, again, be very careful about what are the time constraints on some of the emergency spending we might agree that we need right now. But how do we really truly make an emergency so that these deficits, uh, you know, don't plague us forever? Yeah. It's a shame that there isn't much uh, conversation about what these deficits actually cost us as individuals. There is this sense that somehow there's an entity out there called the government that can somehow just give us money when we need it. Uh, and there's not a, a, coordinate, a corresponding sense of what it's actually going to cost us down the road. Um, sure, uh, the economy... Uh, pumps up, uh, it can get rid of deficits very easily, but uh, you can't guarantee that with the present global circumstances. Uh, here's a question about the green economy. Uh, looks like it's from Sal. Is the green economy an opportunity to rebuild the global economy? And Philip, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, can I just um, add something to that oh, last question do. as well, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go on to, to, that, sure. um, to, that, to that question. Um, I think one of the one of the things that concerns um, us at the Logatum Institute is that only one side of the equation is being looked at. So we are very, very focused in the UK on deaths from COVID um, and doing everything we possibly can to prevent those. But on the other side of the equation, we're not focused at all on increased deaths from cancer or increased um, deaths from, from cardio or even the, nor the number of people who normally die from flu uh, or pneumonia every year. It's like we're not doing these calculations. You then add into that the educational deficit to our children. And in the UK, we're looking at another 10 million kind of mental health incidents coming through. And then the economy on top of that and the lost jobs and the lost, lost livelihood. We're not having this two-way conversation um, as to um, the the issues on on either side of the equation and I think we we really really need to um, on the on the um, issue of the of the green economy um, I think where um, where there are uh, real developments um, and real industries that don't need government subsidies to get them up and running and that really contribute to our economy and that also um, support the environment, then I think that, 
you know, there can be some really good things coming out of it. What concerns me is the development of a whole industry that wouldn't get up and grow and develop unless it was subsidised um, by, the, by the government. Because normally, um, if people have need of something or can see that something will benefit them, the market will just drive that forward and what I don't really understand with this is why when we all want to believe want to live in a in a world that's freer um that's cleaner greener um why why it's needing so much government subsidy to get us to move to that place if it really is um what we you know what what we're wanting to do what we value which we say we do so I think that 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 I have some real concerns over what what really produces wealth and well-being for, for a nation. Uh, Anne, uh, your comments on the green economy. I couldn't agree more. I, I, it, that raises real questions, right? If this is, you know, an innovative sector of the economy, then you would expect to see a, a lot of growth there. And so I think the problem, and I agree with Philippa, we want a greener economy. We need to think about economizing on energy. That's important. I think it's a stewardship issue. So that's where we need innovation and market forces the most. So I actually think what we need to think about there is how how do we get kind of government out of the subsidy business as it pertains to that? But, you know, to the broader question, I, I don't think we can say, well, the economy is hurting. We're in a pandemic. So Let's use the green, you know, kind of economy to try to double down and in, invest in that to get us out of it. Because, again, I think the market will do that already if given the opportunity. So to me, removing some of that interference and subsidy will, will allow that um, aspect of the economy to take off um, rather than viewing it as just another kind of stimulus project. Let's put money in this and hope that this will help us with our financial troubles in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, Larry asks a question, uh, begins with a statement, capitalism lifts people out of poverty. Uh, This is a statement which uh, over the last 25, 30 years has become fairly common uh, among conservatives uh, who are champions of free markets and uh, or classic liberals. How do we encourage, I guess he's asking, how do we encourage uh, capitalism while limiting abuses, abuses are not stated here, but I imagine he means things that are criminal or immoral. Uh, ideas on that, Anne? Yeah, so many ideas. I will keep my comments short, but uh, I, I think this is such an important question and such an important topic. I think a couple things that are important here. One, we just need to look at what is capitalism So I think the reason that there's questions around this and this is hotly debated in our culture is because this word is thrown around without a lot of meaning. Right. Right. Um, Same for socialism. Um, But, you know, at the end of the day, we're always dealing with human beings, which they are vastly creative, made in the image of God, but they are also fallible and corruptible. So they are both the blessing and the curse simultaneously. So what we need to do is Think of systems that take people as they are and then, you know, kind of encourage and incentivize them to serve other people. That's what markets do. They do that very effectively, but they're not perfect. So I think we need to be very honest about that. How do we kind of mitigate abuses? I, I actually think it's by letting the market do its thing. We need to not bail out people who fail because we think that, you know, the business is too big. So we saw this in the financial crisis, you know, too big to fail. We're talking about breaking up um, big tech because we think it's too big. And so I think, again, these are presumptions that the government knows what size a business should be and that we can't let big ones fail. And I think, again, that disrupts what the market would do. I think when businesses make bad decisions, they should fail and they should be held accountable to that. And then they should find new things to do. And I think that is what mitigates the abuses the best. Uh, Philip, to you on this. Capitalism uh, has lifted so many out of poverty. Uh, it also comes under strong critique. Uh, how can we, again, encourage uh, free markets uh, to lift people out of poverty, but avoid any of the criminal or immoral elements that might come with freedom? I think absolutely. I mean, going back to my kind of opening remarks about, you know, what's happened in India and China and the the billions of people who've been lifted out of poverty, that was not done through a welfare program. That was done through free trade and and capitalism. And I think we forget this at 
at our peril, really. But we also need to um, remember that a market is just a market. It's just it's just neutral and that actually it is inhabited and populated by people. And it's the character of those people um, who are building those businesses and running those businesses that that matters. And um, we haven't really had um, an, a nationwide conversation around the around character and around um, uh, you know what it means to be someone of character. Um, it's really interesting. One of the books that's had huge um, kind of impact in the UK was um, David Brooks's A Road to Character mm-hmm. book, looking at the difference between um, the CV character traits and the eulogy um, kind of character traits. What do we want to be remembered for? And actually, how can we bring those eulogy character traits of kindness, generosity, um, sacrifice, service into our into our business life as well, because that's actually what we value at the at the end of the end of the day. And if our businesses were run um, by the sort of people um, uh, people of character, that would go a long way to restoring um, the morality of capitalism. Oh, several uh, calls have come in asking about churches in the pandemic and uh, what you think about the restrictions that have been put on uh, public worship as a result of the pandemic. I don't know what you have in uh, Great Britain, but here in the United States, there's been lots of complaints because churches aren't considered non-essential services. Philippa? Yeah, so we are we are restricted. Um, we have pivoted our church to being online, as I'm sure hundreds of thousands of mm-hmm. churches across the the US ha- have done as well. Um, we had about a six week period in the middle there, or two month period, where we were able to meet again, um, and um, uh, but we weren't allowed to sing. And I think what causes frustration here is the lack of science behind some of these things. Actually, yeah. I don't believe there is any scientific evidence. For We've only got about 15 seconds left, and I want to make sure that Anne has a chance to weigh in just a little bit on this. Anne, Great. I think there words? will be civil di- disobedience if the <laughs> churches aren't opened again yeah, soon. <laughs> I think so. Anne, go ahead. I agree. I, this is a concern to me. I think that, again, churches uh, do not want their parishioners to get sick, and we need to allow them to innovate. I think this is yeah. a huge hit and blow to religious freedom, and it's already being seen in the courts. Yeah. And that's a good thing. we got to fight that. But I think this is a real problem because I think we can do it safely, and you know, people yeah. want to want to be safe. So let's let them figure it out. Let me thank you, uh, Dr. Ann Rathbone bradley uh, Baroness Philippa Strout for being with us today. And uh, let me thank all of you who participated uh, in this uh, Acton Institute uh, Poverty Cure Summit, focusing especially on the pandemic in poverty. I'm Al Cresta. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can reach our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Actonline, I'm Eric Cohn.